Hey, welcome to 23 Degrees Sideways. We're going to talk about the psychology of majoritarianism. I'm having a hard time with this one. I've done this video a couple of times now. I did actually had a really good take, but the wind was so bad you couldn't hear me. Um, you know, I did a video recently about the 17th Amendment and how the 17th Amendment reduced the importance of the state on the federal stage by changing how you... Uh, elect your senators into a, a, a mass majoritarian movement, which is susceptible to more um, marketing influence, press influence, inter interference from out-of-state money. Bloomberg money is basically what everyone calls it right now, right? Um, and that's true as far as it goes, but there's also the majoritarian psychology to look at. A representative government was set up fairly specifically to prevent the excesses and the bigotry of majoritari majoritarianism. Also, the uh, attention span of majoritarianism. You know, there's always an emergency of the day. And, you know, if you look, if you look at what the multinational corporate media presents as an emergency this week or next week or last week, you know, you get the CNN, the Washington Post, the New York Times, <clears throat> Fox, everybody all together, and there's an issue. They could get a majority to vote on nearly anything, up to and including death camps, on any given week. And then people would forget about it the next week, because there would be another another emergency. And that's that's one of the dangers of pure majoritarianism. But it also points to the psychology of majoritarianism, which is restrictive. It's a, it's a, it's an attempt to use a group, a society, a large group of people, a mob, to impose its will on a minority. It's almost always restrictive. It's almost always proscriptive or regulatory. Somehow, um, it causes other people to have to do something, pay something, or give something up to the majority. Now, when the founders started this whole experiment, this whole American experiment, they, were, they weren't dumb people, okay? These weren't a bunch of dumb hick farmers. They read every book they could get their hands on. If you look at the availability of certain books in, in the United States or the colonies in the 18th century, you can see that they literally could not print some philosophical books, some classics, fast enough, okay? There were a lot of Enlightenment books, that, Enlightenment era books, that you just could not print fast enough to satisfy the appetite of the American. We have always had a fairly high literacy rate, um, and we've always been voracious at, about self-education. It's part of the liberty concept, you know. Uh, it promotes the idea, the process, the benefits, the values, the self-satisfaction, the serotonin hit, the, uh, the, the positive emotions of self-education. Now, these people were not dumb, and they came up with an idea of a representative government so that we could avoid the psychology of majoritarianism. The idea of representative government is primarily a, a, a way to protect individual liberty, to put layers between the majority, the majority freak out and action against individual liberty. These, these layers are the representative government. And, you know, Jefferson talked about the natural aristoi, you know, a group of people who just naturally will tend to be selected for these representative positions. And in a more or less pure world, without a whole lot of sneaky shenanigans, backroom deals, um, that works pretty well. You know, we've, we've, we've actually, we still do fairly well with it, especially compared to the rest of the world, but we do have to struggle with the Davos elite, the backroom billionaires, the corporate media. There's, there are people who have interests who try to usurp the, the forms and the mechanisms of our government. And they're being pretty successful right now, actually. Uh, the internet has is definitely a two-edged sword there. So, 
the idea of the representative government is that there there are people who will gravitate towards that. And it's not necessarily that they have the desire for power. It's that they have the desire for understanding, the desire to talk to people, the desire to work with people. There are a lot of different ways to look at this besides just the, um, the petty seeking power over others. Because that's actually one of the fundamental concepts of the psychology of majoritarianism, is that they want power over others. And most majoritarian ideas or ideals involve some sort of negative, some sort of regulation of individual liberty, negation of individual liberty, quite often negation of individualism. You know, if your individual, if your individualism is seen as a threat to my group, then I'm going to try to get rid of your individualism. You know, there's a lot less live and let live, let people be themselves, do what they want, when you get to majoritarianism. They'll use the language of it, but when you look at what what majorities vote for, what majorities want, what majorities do, the psychology of majoritarianism is using a group of people to help you feel strong in restricting another person or group of people. I talked about pumping people up, okay, recent video about how Ameri uh, humans, sorry, I almost said Americans, but humans in general have an infinite capacity to create hierarchies, which allows everyone to be at the top or near the top or in a competitive position in a hierarchy, some hierarchy, matchstick, matchstick model builders, reloaders, gun aficionados, car people, car wheel shining people. I mean, there's entire forums just on how to polish aluminum, right? There, there's, we, we have an infinitely creative space, okay? If you literally have nothing else going on, you can actually do baked peanut butter art. You can make that into a movement. Sounds silly, but there's a polymerization of the, of the oils in there that could actually you, you can make this work, right? Um, you make anything work. There's the, 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 the problem here, the, the, there's a, this is not the main distinction, but it is a primary distinction in humans, is whether you can get your hierarchical position independently with admiration from others, with accomplishment, with a sense of self-accomplishment, or if you have to do it by denigrating others, by being above others. There's a difference between admiration and submission, okay? And you'll find this a lot in very high-functioning military groups, okay? Uh, this actually applies to, to, to a lot of things. You can find this in very high-functioning um, firefighting groups, especially wilderness firefighting. Um, you know, high-functioning high dive, the dive community, the um, skydiving community. It's not just military. Military is a really good example because when you get to the higher-functioning military groups, what you have is you have smallish teams, very tribal, okay? Now, it's a positive sense of the word tribal. But they have an absolute trust in each other, and they have an admiration. There is, you know, there, there's always a conflict. There's always a need for submission and an emergency for something. That, it's always there. I'm not going to paint the rosy unicorn poop picture. But the basis of advancement in your your personal psychology doesn't come from forcing another person to submit to you but in earning their admiration that's a very very important distinction and i think that this distinction falls into place with majoritarianism with the majoritarian distrust of representative government they don't like the idea that representative governments might disagree with them because they have a mass of people that makes them feel important and like they have the power to force others to submit 
and submission is a key element here. So, you know, and I'm not saying that the House of Representatives does, doesn't become a majoritarian body. It's large enough that it absolutely is a mob. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying that, that the representative government system is pure and good and perfect, but it is a layer and it provides for a different framework, a different way of looking at government decisions, a different way for looking at citizen input, the input of the final individual sovereign um, authority of government, which is a, the government derives out of the individual. The individual is the sovereign grantor of power. And we live in a society right now where a lot of that doesn't seem to follow. A lot of people really don't seem to get that idea that the individual grants the power to the state. It's more, and this, this is, again, this falls with the psychology of majoritarianism, that the majority, the society, the group, the collective, the so society has the power over the individual and has the importance over the individual and gets to determine individual importances. This is not just something that you find on the left, you find this on the right. Conservatives who have a view of classical values being absolutely critical, um, you know, they, they have, they, they do the same thing. They tend to have more rules. They, they tend to have some boundaries, okay? Classical Western conservatism has boundaries. You do not go into someone's bedroom. You know, there's, there's ex excesses and exceptions, and you can find an exception to that anywhere, but the general idea is that there is a privacy, and that if you don't throw what you do in the bedroom in someone's face, no one cares, right? The, the, the left, the progressive side of majoritarianism, doesn't have that. There's no boundaries. Nonetheless, classic conservatism is, is very much based on an idea of a society, a culture, having a viewpoint that is relatively enforceable. You know, it is, it is very much majoritarian. So take, take what I'm saying as kind of middle of the road. I'm not coming down on progressives necessarily in this video. I'm not coming down on conservatives necessarily in this video. I do find that there is more tolerance of people being on the edges, people living their own lives on the edges with conservatives than there is with the, the progressive left. That's a different topic. It gets back into the edges. Where, how can you live on the edges of society? It's much easier with a conservative society, honestly. Um, a rich conservative society. That's actually kind of a key element there. Majoritarianism, whichever way you look at it, is based on the idea of getting a group around you, being part of a group, and submission is, a, is the game here, so you're going to be submitting to someone else unless you are the top of the top of the top, and that group forces others to submit to them. That's how majoritarianism works. It's not the idea of an independent person choosing a representative. You know, if I get to get around a table with 15 people, and we all are independently capable people, and we choose a representative to represent us going to a, the next larger polity. It's not necessary that I agree with the other 14 people at the table. It's not necessary that I like them. It's necessary that we have enough trust in our own individual sense of self and capability to choose a representative and trust that the representative is a reasonably honest and integrous person. All these things can break down, and when they break down, you end up with majoritarianism, which is, I got a group of people, my gang is bigger than your gang, you will submit. So, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to point out there's a lot of mess in everything I'm saying right here. There's no, there's no clear, bright line. 
the best I can do is say that representative government is one way of helping to prevent the excesses of the majority. And if you want a society where individual self-affirmation, being able to rise in a your hierarchy, get your, get, be the top lobster in whatever your thing is, without putting other people down, if you want that opportunity, if you want to grow that kind of environment, representative government does it, allows for it. Majoritarianism doesn't allow for it. Majoritarianism relies on forcing minorities to submit. And it doesn't matter whether you like the minority or whether you've defined the minority. Okay, billionaires are the minority today. You know, business owners are the minority for coronavirus. Whatever. It doesn't matter how you define it. The fact is, submission of the minority to your group and that desire to join the majority, to be part of that group, those are the key factors. And majoritarianism, thus... My, my position is something to be avoided almost at all costs. Um, you know, that's it. That's, that's all I've got. This is going to turn into a whole bunch of videos in the next couple of years, but we're talking about the psychology of majoritarianism, which is almost always going to be restrictive and regulatory and demand submission of another group. That's not the way to elevate all of humanity. Stay sideways and uh, stay safe.